Every now and again in the hobby, we come up against a challenge. That could be a technique you haven't done before, it could be a style you've not tried before, it could be a brand of new paints, it could be anything. So this tutorial covers one of my personal challenges in the hobby, which is the brilliant Chaos Lord on Demonic Mount in seven hours when the heavy metal version, which is insane, took them seven days. Quite the challenge. We're gonna be wrapping up some of the, <laughs> thank you compressor. We're gonna be wrapping up some of the analysis from our recent TMAT video. Where we're looking at paint properties and decisions. We're gonna be trying to use efficiency where we can. And we're also gonna use a lot of principles from our very popular 8020, where do you spend your time to get the most value out of it video that we did on the Necron Lord. So like that one, we're gonna be concentrating on high quality metallics. We're gonna make good decisions. And we're gonna try and get the most use out of our time. This isn't just relevant if you're trying to copy box art or heavy metal or anything like that. Here you'll see a lot of decision making which you can use on your own models to really get a great result in whatever time you have available. And before we get to it, yes, the metallics are dry brushed. You can dry brush metallics. Dry brushing metallics is amazing and it's super, super, super efficient in comparison to manually painting them, especially trying to get them at a high level. You can make your minds up as to whether I managed it or not. We're using dry brushes and washes. We've got some verdigris going on. Let's jump in. So we have 100% started things off on the right foot when I realized that I glued this piece on somehow back to front because I can't do left or right. Let's head back to front to it either. Yeah, the way that that fits on the model now is currently like this, which is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> we'll fix that. I think it, it's a bit too high for my liking, the bottom bit of it anyway, so I'll just chop through and then try and emulate that angle, but the other way. At least I've done it wrong immediately. That's me making mistakes out the way now, right? I guess we'll see. We've primed it pretty carefully. Let's work out a base coat. Unsurprisingly, we're gonna be doing the majority part of the model first. Now, someone asked me recently, aren't you always meant to go inside out? By that, I mean, you start on the bits of the model that are the most recessed, and then you come to the bits that are sticking out the most. So that if you make a mistake, you're kind of making them backwards and you're gonna cover them over anyway. Generally, that's quite a good way to work, but for me, the best way to work is you do the biggest, messiest thing first, whether that's inside or outside. And for me, that is the metallics. Now, one of the biggest questions that people had about metallics in general was contrast, how to achieve from dark to light. Also about the issue of getting highlights that kind of show up. One of the biggest tips I would give you is to start darker. And you can start darker by mixing a paint in that isn't a metallic and is dark. And what that's gonna do is that's going to make your base coat slightly less shiny and it will leave you room to come up and highlight through. So let's make a start with that. So we're gonna drag a bit of our silver in and keeping this very pure um, in terms, I'm not adding any colors in. I often add colors into my metallics, especially in the base coats, but according to the paint job on this, it's definitely just silver, silver. It's not blue steel, it's not rusty, it's just pure silver, silver. And as I said, I've got my reference at the back always. Tail can come off and the rider can come off too. Um, I've got a little mark from the priming anyway. Now I do want it really dark. I think that's just about dark enough. You can see I'm going back for more moisture to help the paint that I've got on the brush leave the brush. I'm not just caking it on with more paint. This is one of the ways to achieve high quality base coats. Also, we're using really high coverage paints, so they should leave the brush really easily and pretty much cover it in one coat. I'll still probably do two, but I'll have a very, very good quality coat even just after one. Gonna use my palette as a reference. So there's the color that I'm happy with. I won't try and avoid areas. You know, if I get it on the skulls, that's fine. I won't try and hit them. But um, yeah, it really doesn't matter if you get it on areas that aren't gonna be metallic because they're gonna need a base coat anyway. This is part of doing the messiest, biggest process first. You just don't have to worry about what's going on. All you worry about is getting a really high quality job. As you can see, it's just a joke. Um, we've chosen good coverage paints. We're doing this in the right way. He's got a wobbly head. I'm gonna do this all over the rest of the model and uh, then we're good to go. Okay, so the first stage was a joke. It was literally five minutes um, to get all the metallics done at a really good quality as well. I keep banging on about it, but make the right selection to the paints you're using. Dilute things and uh, you don't even have to take your time. It just goes right first time pretty much. So start in, on a large area. Start in the bit that's gonna be the brightest or a bit that's gonna get covered over. So for us, that's where it's gonna turn gold. We want less of it on the brush and we want to have to work more to get it to leave the brush. If you have any temptations whatsoever to speed up at this point, ignore them. They're wrong. 
fight your instincts. You're going fast enough already. You've got a great big brush, you're covering a lot of ground. Don't rush it. Don't miss anywhere. That's another big risk of rushing is just missing an entire, you know, bit of horsey foot armor. Make sure to give it attention from all angles, not just areas, but angles. Like I can hit this, but unless I come from the top, this bit just, it won't get touched. It literally won't get touched. When in doubt, circles, but do change the angle of the model, normally with your holding hand rather than the brush as well. Just realize there's a buckle down there. We'll probably paint that separately. Okay. Don't accidentally sneak up in terms of how light it is. You have your reference on your palette. Use that reference. It should match your previous, uh, your previous blob on the palette, so make sure it does. If you want your paint to leave more easily, you can use water rather than more paint. Overloading is never the answer. Get to the guy. Again, notice I'm not, I'm not going and adding more paint again and again and again. Cheers, Manchester. You got us. We appear to be good. I've got a choice here. I can do one more step of dry brushing and then wash, or I can wash and then dry brush. I'm going to do the wash first because the next stage of dry brushing will smooth it. So any, any mistakes that happen with washing, they don't tend to happen in the recesses, that happen on the raised areas because the dry brushing will hit the raised areas. If we do the wash sooner than we think, we'll get a far higher quality result. Okay, so I forgot to put a wash out. I was just going to use an oil anyway. My intent with this is to just knock back the recess. It's also going to panel shade for us which is black line, the edge of the panels in particular, because that's how the new null oil works. I'm going to use it pretty thin. Don't need to use it um, as in like the amount that's on there, not thinned down. So let's find somewhere super textured. It's particularly important for like chainmail. So I'll test it there first. Okay, I think we're good. Don't rush. Pretty important with this step. I'm going to drag it against details. You can see I'm getting that accidental shading there. I might remove a little bit and drag it against details I want to specifically catch. I'll take my time. I'm not going to mess around with the orientation of my model in order to make sure that it doesn't end up running in two directions. So this guy's going to remain vertical. I won't tip him up for access. I'll try and get in there. Now, just as a note, really do make care to avoid pooling. Um, I'm actually going to leave this to make sure that some area is fully dry. I'm going to show you the four or five areas where I've had excess pooling because it stands to reason that if you're painting this model, you're going to have the problem in the same places. I've actually mopped it out of a few of them. You can see the evidence of that here. So here was one. Here was another. It's anything that comes down into a V is often problematic or anything where you've got a rivulet to a recessed area. Same with these ones here and the bottom of these. On the head, there was uh, one in particular around here and always be careful of eyes. They're just if stuff gets in there, it won't get out. There's no effort to run out. And then on the guy itself, uh, there was one really bad area. Um, so stuff will run from here, down that rivulet and into this recessed area where it won't disappear. Same with the bottom of these areas. So generally his right shoulder left as we're looking at it is a, uh, a problem area. Aside from that, it was good elsewhere, but just make sure not to get any excess pulling. You can see even here, like just be really light with it and absolutely leave it to dry. I'm actually just gonna go and climb I think and uh, I'll be back in a couple of hours and this will definitely be dry then because it's not worth screwing things up. All right we are back from using my hands climbing. Fully dry 100%. It's still got a bit of sheen to it which is just because we used a wash and um, this is the washes are a bit shiny but it has knocked back the metallic aspect of it quite a lot. It's kind of like a cool cool grey. Null oil is a bit warm actually. It's got a tiny bit of a brown to it I would say. We'll push that back though with the next step so Essentially, we're just going to repeat what we did for our last step. Again, we've got the reference on our palette. That's so important. If we're trying to match a mix of colors, let's say you're doing this over an army, you can make up like a few bottles that were mixes, or as I'm doing here, you can just match it to the relevant point on your palette. Just check the how much it's leaving, the quality as well. Looks like we're good. So it's everywhere. We're not pushing it into all the recesses. I'll be keeping this kind of circular motion on the go. But we are wanting to let the model highlight itself, leaving those darker areas in the recesses. I really like the quality of that. It's a shame we're covering it over. <laughs> Don't forget spikes. It's really easy to kind of 
leave bits that stick out. Everywhere needs covering. Saddle two and neck. I can actually go to him while I've got more on the brush. So we're okay with him having a slightly heavier coat. Still leaving the recesses. And the chainmail's got high contrast anyway. It's either dark or light, so we don't need to worry too much about that. If for any reason you can't reach any area, there's a bit that I can't reach in his helmet there. You can drop down in brush size, but I would always use the biggest brush you can and try and be creative with how you manage to get into recesses. You can twist and stuff, and you can even squeeze your bristles if it's just for a little bit. Not having to change between brushes is ideal, and the bigger ones will give you overall the highest quality. All right, may as well roll straight into the next step, which is a lighter one, starting with the rider, because as I said, he wants to be the brightest, so it makes sense when we've got the most paint on the brush. Now I do want this lighter. Again, no rushing. It's not the point of what we're doing. We're trying to achieve a high quality result. If you were layering this, it would take a lot of time. So we need to take that approach. I'm being soft with the pressure, so I'm hitting less. You can see on this section here. Any mistakes we made with our black wash now are basically hidden, which is really nice. Now onto the horsey. Even lighter. Just kind of buffing things up. Need to be careful and stop soon enough with the horse. I'm going to pop him to the side. I really thoroughly clean the brush. I'm going to go for pure silver, which obviously looks quite a lot brighter than anything else we've got on the palette. So work this in, be careful with it, dot on the chains, really soft touch. I always hold it in the same place. Maybe I'd work it a little bit forwards for firmer stuff, but here the only thing that we're changing really is I've got a much looser grip. You can specifically try and hit edges with this step, so always just go against them. If it's a line like this, go from the left, go from the right, don't go this way. Make sure to come at your model from all angles, like his, I think it's called a gorget, I might be wrong there. The uh, bit that protects him from having his neck stabbed. If I don't go from this angle, it'll be quite hard to hit that. Be disciplined, even if you're having fun, this is the one step. You don't want to rush it necessarily, but you don't want to spend too long in areas because you will gradually just build things up to be lighter. This bit looks brilliant, looks so good. That is the chainmail, but chainmail is kind of a dream for dry rushing. Definitely get those horns, as you want them the lightest, the horns on the armor. I've saved the last step of dry brushing of the silver on this um, because I want to share steps with the gold. The gold's going to be a little bit scary, but we're going to get there. So the brush that I've grabbed for this is a, it's got a red dot on the end. Whenever you see a red dot on the end, it's one of my tired brushes. It's a size 1M. So it's a little stubby one. It's quite nice for controlled work because obviously my fear here is that I don't want to spill onto the trim, which is meant to be silver. So what we're going to do is we're going to block out a base coat. I'm going to put a little bit of brown in with that, dried bark. It's going to help the gold kind of bite. And we're also going to put a little bit of black in. This is to make the, old, the gold look older. I'm going to grab it thin with a bit of water to start. There's nowhere I can really test that isn't scary. I'll just have to go for it. I'm going to keep it thin. We're not looking to build up texture with this at all. I think what I'm going to do straight away, I'm going to have to put some more brown in there. Okay, yeah, that color's better. That'll do. I'm going to dilute it. I'm going to take my time. Now, this is going to be verdigreed, so that gives us one really nice kind of forgiving aspect, which is that we don't need to be perfect up to the edges. They're going to get completely verdigreed. So if you don't want to go to the edges on this model, um, don't, you know, risk mistakes getting there when literally you're not even going to be required to paint them and you're going to weather over them anyway. That's it, blocking in now. Boring, repetitive, but uh, don't be too enthusiastic with it because a slip would be very sad. You know, just to show you guys, I've only done it fully on one so far instead of going all over. See, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. 
two or three steps. Uh, it will look awful after the first. You'll have these weird drifts and stuff like that, especially if you didn't mix the paint like I did. Um, so the metallic and the non-metallic bits for separating, mix it thoroughly. But two or three steps and you should be good. It only needs to be perfect, or at least good, here and in the middle. Towards the edges, don't worry about it. Towards the bottom, where it's going to be completely verdigreed, don't worry about it. So like this section here that's catching the light on camera now, that's the only bit that I'm really concerned about it having to be super smooth. So take your time there especially. That took a fair while. Um, it's done now. We made some discoveries because I should have used GW360 view uh, while going when I realized that actually these bits, which is kind of a shame so I really liked how they looked in silver. They're gold. I was tempted to leave them, but then I thought that I probably should commit. So they've been done. This guy was done with just pure retributor. Um, it took a little bit longer, a couple of coats, because it's not got the brown in there. Um, you could do it with brown and then again, but I figured I was just going to have to wrap it regardless. So yeah, he's been done with pure retributor on the artwork, his gold and his silver is shinier than the rest. So that's why he's been done with the pure one. We're going to use some secret tech now. Looking forward to this. The secret tech that we're going to use in this point is kind of selective stippling uh, to get around the fact that we can't paint the trim. If we get anything on the raised parts of the trim, it's not the end of the world because we're going to be doing an all over silver dry brush at the end. Um, so that'll pick them up. But I did have a few slips that are on the edges. Hopefully they get hidden in the washing stage or they're enough to get caught by our silver dry brush. Of course, if anything doesn't get caught, I can fix it at the end, but I'd rather not fix them. What magic are we employing to kind of make this work? Let's go to the model and analyze what we've got going on. So we've got a really, really rich gold. I was tempted to achieve it with glazes over the silver. Check out the Necron if you want to see how I did that. So you just use a contrast or glazes and you can get a really good looking gold. This has got so much richness to it though, I want to use those washes over the gold. Before then though, the bit that's kind of made this doable and I think a bit easier for me is, as you can see in the highlights here, it basically goes to silver. So the important touchstones for me are that I probably need to go to like Reekland Flesh Shade in the recesses, that's really easy, it's wash. I need to go up through a bit of gold, it's kind of speckledy, which is helpful, stippling, and then it goes to a silver, and that's really helpful too because we've got the nice strong silver and that means that we can use an all over buff to kind of get it there. So let's see if we can put that into practice on the model now. So have to hold in mind, even though Retribute is incredibly strong, this silver is stronger. So if we touch it into the gold, it's going to look really, really very potent. We'll just need to be sparing. I'm just needs to be sparing. I'm going to make a nice thin line on my palette, and that should make should make only getting a little bit a bit more doable. I don't think I'll involve the black. I'm just going to use dilution for now. Um, it is going to be a very different color to the base coat, so I might change my mind on that. Very dilute, so we can see how it's going to behave. We're going to start at the top here because it's the brightest area. Obviously, we're not going to go anywhere near the silver bits. Luckily, it fades to darker um, around them anyway, and we've got the weathering, the verdigris, so I don't think we need to. I might actually get out the extra small in a bit. Okay, so we, we do need the dilution. See, that's how it went without it. It's just a bit too much. We've got to have that water in there and work it in as well. Okay, that's it. All we can do is just patiently do that. Drop down brush sizes where applicable. I may even, I'll show you this beforehand actually, just because we've not shown it on the channel before. So I may even use my M. For teeny tiny stippling. You can always jump to this between gaps, but like I said, we don't need to worry about it too much down here because of the verdigree. Having taken our time with that, it didn't take too long. The blocking in was actually far more time intensive. We're going to add a little bit of silver in, which if anything makes this kind of less worrying if you hit the trim, because it's closer to it. And we're going to kind of buff these areas up. We're basically just kind of powder approaching it. So there's a very small amount of paint on the brush, and we're trying to pick the areas where the light hits it the most from this angle, which is the top, like the paint job. And we're just carefully building up that kind of silvery texture. It doesn't matter if it's perfect or not because on the paint job there's this kind of mottled effect going on and we're definitely using that to our advantage. Don't miss areas like the feet, it's really easy to miss them. They're kind of lighter towards the edges so just traditional dry brushing. And because we're going to do a final silver dry brush if you get it on the trim, as long as it's done with dry brushing you'll be covering that with following steps anyway so you don't have to worry nearly so much as you'd think we're getting there progress is happening
Okay, so it's wash time. I'm going to use a smaller brush than I used last time because this is quite a careful one and we really need to make sure we don't screw up kind of all of our layers of good work that we've got. Requin Fresh Shade is one of my go-tos for kind of warm, unctuous gold. And it definitely feels like if they did use one on the paint job, it's this. Okay, so I'm going to be using it very thin like a glaze initially. We'll just see how it looks on one area. I'll choose somewhere that will be fairly hidden. And the idea is that we're going to drag it downwards towards where we want it the darkest and we'll end there. I think that's actually okay. Yeah, I think we'll just do two steps of that all over. Let's go to a big panel and see how effective it is there. Big sweeping thin steps for sure to start with. Make sure you end against the edges. I definitely should have uh, left time after hair drying that. To be fair, even if we get a little bit of mottling, it's probably fine, given that it's on the paint job. Getting there. That color match is a. Uh, there's definitely. I think we need to do the silver step again, and even more obviously, that's absolutely fine. Um, I think I'm going to dry brush all over once with silver, do a wash, and then repeat it. So that, just that all over, and then we'll repeat the silver dry brush at the end. Okay, looking good. So with that done, we're on to defining edges. Now I'm going to make sure that I don't bother defining these because I'm going to cover them in verdigris, or if I do, I won't do it particularly carefully. But elsewhere, especially on the rider, and to go for that heavy metal style, rather than carefully painting things and leaving bits, we're just going to put the bits that we should have left back in. So probably you should swap to an S rather than M here. They release a little, little bit best paint, but... I will show you as I've got it in my hand. So we're just going to be pushing up to all of those details all over. And this is going to give us that nice hard separation between areas. You can add a little bit of black into it if you want, if you want to have something that makes an effect more quickly. Um, but if you're worried about making slips or whatever, then you can just do this process twice. All right, it is a fresh day. Always nice to kind of go away and come back to a piece. It stops you from stewing on it too much. I was struck with indecision about whether to try and fix the gold or not. I'm still really pleased with how it looks, but it's not quite aesthetically in terms of, you know, it's not fully accurate. Um, it should have been a bit warmer. The mistake that we've made is I should have involved a pure gold step uh, more widely and broadly over our base coat. Pretty obvious in retrospect. This gold looks pretty good, but it's not quite um, the level of that. That one, we just went from Retributor and washed it a few times. So if you're doing it differently, that's what I go for. Thanks for voting, by the way. I put this down to the viewers um, on Instagram and overwhelmingly you voted for just roll with it and discuss it. So yeah, pretty pleased with it. Uh, big consideration is we're about to put a load of weathering at some point around here, and it's going to be bright teal, the verdigris. That's going to make this look more yellow. So it might end up looking significantly closer than it does now. Legs have been blocked in with Incubi Darkness mixed with black. Uh, we are about a 105 minutes in, so approaching the two hour mark. And um, yeah, I don't know what we're going to do next. I need to, at this stage, this is when I start getting bored. <laughs> so I really have to manage what I do. I'm going to start with some fairly boring tasks uh, that just need doing and blocking in. And then we'll move on to some steady stuff once I've warmed up a bit. I might paint the banners in preparation for the scary freehand that's coming up. We'll see about that. So. I'm going to get our mix of um, Screamer Pink and uh, Black down on the base of this, uh, leaving lots of room for highlighting. I won't make the same mistake that I made on the gold. We've got to base coat with Word Bearer's Red, our leather points like the strap, and then there's some even some slightly hidden points that I'll just touch. I don't have to worry about these being perfect at all, but uh, we'll get them. Um, yeah, so boring base coating. Let's go. Okay, so we've done some of the base coating. It's time to get techie. We're trying to do this efficiently. So, um, you know, also we're not as good as Team Heavy Metal because they're gods. I'm going to use wet blending to try and get this fade. What we've got really helpfully on this detail on the horns is that they've got a raised detail above them. So we should manage to get away with OK blending underneath and, you know, just use distraction to pull attention away from that. So the way that I'm going to go about this is I've got Celestial Grey, I've got white, I've got black. I'm going to pop Celestial Grey in the middle, keeping things fairly wet, and then we're going to have to work fast. 
Right, let's go. Our reference is here. So I'm going to put a band around the top third, get a bit of white, mix it in. It's too much. All the white is too strong. And all we can do is just go fast before things are dried and try to get it to a state that we're happy with. You don't want it too thick, it's kind of easily done, but also it's quite easy to pull away from. Starting to dry now, but I think we've done passably. And then what I'll do is I'll just put it roughly on the highlights. You can dip it in water, but it is faster to lick it. <laughs> it's not perfect, but we've just laid a foundation. The foundation's what's kind of important here. We'll do that and I regret our life decisions. <laughs> oh, there's so many horns on this model. Okay, we're dry. Now, it is a natural object, so we can get away with things not being perfect at all. Remember to keep referring back to the piece. I think maybe I should be using a bone in retrospect. We'll uh, have a look how it is when it's finished. So as you can see, it's looking kind of passable, which is the aim. Yeah, they did its heavy metal, so of course they highlighted it to the very edge. I'm going to dilute it. I'm probably going to spend more time on the head ones because the head's got it's going to get more attention. It's more important and larger piece of the model. Soften these a little with the glaze. We can, of course, glaze into the recesses as well, which I will do. OK, so that's looking pretty good. It's not dark enough at the end. We brought it up so we can push it back down now. I'm just going to use non oil for this, I think. It's so important to have your piece behind you guys. Um, physical copies, a tablet, physical copies are best though. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to bring it into focus. I'm going to use this to darken the end. So let, let's say we were applying mass to this. I could go one, two, three, four, five, have a stroke in all of them, move one down, miss a couple out. Go down again. Jump two more steps. And that way we're going to get a natural fade here as we've got less repeats. And it's so fast because you've, you know, you're not even reloading the brush at this point. And because it's transparent, you can't make any big mistakes really. I can also use this to kind of dull my edge highlights towards the end. Okay, I reckon that's pretty possible. Be far easier when I'm not on camera as well, so it shouldn't take too long for the head. While we're here, I realized, you know, I'm talking about it being the head and it being important, I think we can justify a, uh, a final, very careful white step. I'll see if I can do it with this brush because I'm kind of used to the behavior of it now, which is something that people underrate. You know, even though this is my base coating brush and it's not my best one, I'm currently in tune with how it works because I've been using it on the model so far. So we'll see if we can get away with it. If not, then I'll jump to a, uh, a double zero and just adjust a little bit. Okay, so we want to keep these fine. Fine by my standards, not by heavy metals. Can you tell that I haven't done detail work in years? It is a bit more forgiving than an inorganic surface because the bones are regular, so that kind of helps. Also, if I had made a mistake, I could put like a crack on it or something. Of course, you could glaze these down if, if you thought they were too bright as well. Right, not too shabby. The bit at the end isn't great, let's be honest. Where we'd like that to be skinnier, we can just paint next to it. I can tell you with complete certainty we are coming to the point where my, uh, my attention span is going to really start being an issue with this. So I'm just going to go into power mode and uh, try and get through as much of the bone as possible. I'll show you all the bits that I'm going to be doing elsewhere on the model on the face. I think it's a good example for them because it's quite a small section. I've got some fairly messy purple transitions going on around the gum area. Uh, it's a little bit neater on the model, but what we're going to do is hide it with edge highlighting, which is actually not too dissimilar to what's going on on the model. So I'll add a bit of bone in and do that but beforehand. Just to separate things to leave those lovely black lines in that we like, I'm going to drop in a little black wash around the bottom of each tooth. If this was old non-oil, it would be fine, but 
the new Nuln Oil, as I've mentioned a couple of times, it's quite weak. So um, it's probably a good idea to drop a little bit of paint in there. It doesn't have to be black, it could be something dark that works for the model. I am going to use black though. That's it. That will just really help separate the, um, the gums and the teeth. It's also going to bring down the percentage of it that's purple to just make it look a little bit neater than it actually is. So we're going to be using the wet blending and edging technique uh, that we just use on the horns absolutely everywhere else. You can see this kind of fade from what will be our incubi in black to I'm using Screamer Pink here and we can add a bit of bone in. We're just going to approach everything in the same way all the way around. So we're going to do a blend that's wet blended and fairly fast, kind of passable, and then we'll draw attention away from it with edge highlighting. It's, um, it's surprisingly reliable, guys. Your eyes cannot do anything but look at sharp highlights. So going to pull attention away from our sloppy blends underneath. The teeth on the paint job, they're kind of a, a grey. We're using our Celestra grey for that. Then there's a slightly bonier highlight, and then there's a little dot at the top of each tooth just to represent them being a little bit shinier. It works really well, actually. We're going to do this carefully. It's not many steps, but it's important that we get them right. Too dilute. I think maybe I just need to get there in one step over the grey. Okay. Then hopefully we've left room for the little white dot. If we haven't, we can go back in there with our black. Purple highlights on the gum should be fairly easy. Just mix in a little bit of bone. Kind of missing my stubby brush. Some are going to be easier than others. If you've got an edge to highlight. It's, uh, it's always a bit more simple. Be, uh, be willing to turn things upside down if that helps though, because that's probably, yeah, that's probably what I should have done for this one. Okay, so as you can see, I've done some of the verdigris, just tested it out. The verdigris is pretty heavy on the paint job on the model, like really, really heavy. Um, it takes up quite a lot of space, but there's not a huge amount of variation within the color of it, which I think is kind of interesting. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a first, first pass, which is very, very much diluted, so take green. And the aim here is just to always be pushing it towards the recesses. We've got our reference there behind us, as ever. So you can hold that in mind, but keep rotating the model and you want to end your stroke where you are in the deepest recess between the two layers. Then it will kind of just handle itself in terms of you not making mistakes. Start outside and push inwards. I might have had a little bit too much on the brush, especially at the beginning, but I think we're okay. Okay, so once you've built it up and you're happy with the amount that you've covered, you know, it's not a thin line, it's quite a, a fat fade. What I'm doing is I'm just gonna take a little bit of Gauze Blaster Green, very, very minty green, this one. I'll show you some of that. We had a little paint explosion while I was testing. Oh, God. Why is this happening more than ever in recent videos? Okay, so this I'll use fairly carefully as it's, this is probably the only creative license that I've taken so far with the paint job. I don't think it really quite goes this light, but I feel there should be variation when you get more to the recesses of verdigris. I don't think it'll be a negative as far as the paint job is concerned. And notice how much I'm moving it around. It's really, it's just so much easier if you can get the right angle. Okay, there we go. It looks a little bit more crazy on camera than it is. Also note, that's actually brought this up to make it look more yellow, which is what I was hoping for. So that's kind of great news. All right, that took a while, but uh, it wasn't too bad. About 40 minutes for the two stages all over the entire model. And it has made a big difference. So at least it wasn't a waste of time. The really time intensive things that are left are the skulls mainly actually I would say and then kind of it's little bits and bobs like the free hand on the banner and stuff like that we just need to figure out an efficient way to do the horsey himself so what I think we're going to do is we're going to try a little bit of fairly efficient dry brushing now because there's a lot of dark colors on this model and um, one of the bonuses of those is it's a little bit more forgiving you can tell mistakes on light areas a lot more easily than you can on dark areas so I'm going to see if we can work out a way to play that to our advantage now something in particular that's going to be a bit tricky is this kind of 
purpley fade, which looks incredible. And you've got this, this bluish gray highlight going on, and then we've got purpley fade, and then we go through to a bony color. So I think what we're gonna have to do is a little bit of quick experimentation just to see if we can get a subtle enough dry brush. So I've got Incubi Darkness here. That's not too bad. We can always wash black um, over areas. Now, as I said, because it's it's dark on dark, it's just way more forgiving than it would be otherwise. What my intent is here is to do a two-step dry brush, but we're going to do a wash first of the purple to see if we can kind of sneak our way around quite difficult, delicate work. So we've got the Scream of Pink, which is, I think it's probably the closest color we've got, but we do want a darker version, so I'll grab some black. Could actually mix a bit of the Incubi in if we wanted to. I don't know if that will work, though. Would soften it a bit. Yeah, that's actually quite a good idea. Okay. Now, nothing techy here. It, it's kind of purpley in the recesses, and it's fairly subtle on the model, but I don't think we have to worry because it's so dark and because it's already got black in, and the Incubi, which are the colors that are kind of prevalent on the model elsewhere. We're really trying to work smart, not hard here, because I imagine this section took a lot of time. Um, when done properly. And then just going to put some more water on my brush and we'll fuzz it out. Right down to even just wiping it off with a finger off the raised areas because we do want it in the recesses. Okay, we'll let that dry and then we'll see if we can combine that with a little bit of dry brushing to, uh, to cheat. <laughs> First one barely showed up. I did another one. It didn't really show up. So I've added more of the purple in it and we're just blobbing it in the recesses now. I don't think we need to be careful. or as careful as we were being. So we're going to take that same purple mix that we've still got on our palette and we're going to see if we can transition it slightly into a little bit of the grey that is evident on the tip of the tail. And then just like we've done the horns, try and concentrate it a little bit on the more raised areas. Scary dry brush time. Just pure incubi here. Let's wash my hands after the, uh, the incident with the gauze blaster. Right, try to make sure that this is definitely seeable. If it goes right or wrong. Hey, we're good. It's gone right. Aren't we clever? Wow. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it to work that well, given the time that it's taken. That's uh, that's super cool. This is why we try new things.
LA, this is either future, past, or present Byron, depending on where this is fold and how it <coughs> fold, <coughs> fall in, and if it's being used. Enjoy that one, Ian. Sorry. Uh, so, I have 15 minutes to go on this paint job. I've left the glowing bits till last. Current benefit of hindsight Byron in the third person thinks that was an awful idea. So I've left the scariest bit till last. It kind of makes sense for some sequencing reasons, but I've kind of built this up to more of a thing than it should be. It's also the first and only place I'm gonna deviate from the paint job that is on the box art. And the reason for that is that Games Workshop have somehow managed to pull off using basically the same blue for the verdigris and the same blue for the glowing elements. It's just the glowing elements are a tiny bit more classic magic -y blue and the verdigris is a tiny bit more tealy and turquoisey. I cannot pull that off without it being something that maybe risks the quality of the paint job. And like I said, I shouldn't have left this till the end because now I'm building up to be more than it should be. I'm gonna test out magenta because I feel it's super chaosy and super classic, especially with such a kind of an, an old school chaosy sculpt painted in old-school chaos manor. manner. Um, I feel like some purples and some magentas will work really, really well there. So I'm gonna test it out in one place on the model. Hopefully it goes well. If it does go well, we'll start the clock and we'll get our last 15 minutes in and try and race around everywhere else. Just a note, I would actually use the airbrush for this if I wasn't trying to do this without touching the airbrush. So yeah, if you do have an airbrush, you could absolutely bring it into play here. Basically in the same way that I'm gonna use with dry brushing, but you'd use the airbrush for some of it. You'd still pre-shade with a white to make it lighter um, and then airbrush over that. You could absolutely use this to get your glow in like a slightly less worrying manner if you've got decent control. But uh, yeah, let's jump in, do our test. Fingers crossed. There he is, looking all nice. I am pretty worried about how this is gonna go. So uh, yeah. Uh, hey, we wouldn't learn if we didn't try out new things or push ourselves, so let's just jump in. And yes, this is uh, how chaotic the desk has got. <laughs> I really miss my big texture pad. I need a replacement. Okay, so before we do anything, I'm just gonna test this out on paper, see if it's a good idea. I've not used this in so long. Uh, it's gonna take so much shaking. Fluorescents tend to be a bit goopy. It's really important to make sure that you're not just getting the medium, which obviously we are there. All right, now we're to the paint. Obviously that's super bright. much deeper purple. Next to it, it's gonna look way, way, way darker anyway. But I think that's quite a nice color combination. See if I can put a little dot in. Yeah, I think that's gonna work okay. We've always got white that we can lean into for the highlights. If it was clothing, I'd add a bone or something, but it's not, so we'll probably stick to adding white in there. Let's uh, give it a test on the model. Where will we test this? Maybe the rear one here. I'll try popping down a glaze first or a wash, rather. I might be pretty conservative with it. It's just safer. It can be small glows rather than big ones. I guess I could test on one of the symbols as well. Pick on the ones that worked better. That's kind of well just dropping it in there. I think it's okay and I think it's it's all right with the rest of the model as well. Now to see how it looks once we've brought it up a little. I don't know exactly how I'm gonna go about doing this. I'll make it white. And the moment we do that, we kind of eclipse the fact that there's any color around it because it just pulls attention so much. And then how is a mix? Definitely brought it up a little. Just added a bit of white into our previous mix, which is the fluorescent and the scream of pink. I think what I'm going to do is dot it with a the white, then we'll do a couple of Quick glazy steps. I can't do anything that requires precision here. We don't have the time. Maybe one specific dot to each area, but we want to get the rest of glazing ideally. Or something that's a bit lazy. Cool. 
think that works. Don't know if it pulls too much attention. I guess we'll uh, we'll judge that when we're finished. So while I put off for as long as possible the thing that I said that I shouldn't have put off, I have something that came from a viewer who I can't credit because I can't remember if it was a comment or something like that. This is the box art we are trying to copy. I have had the other one on my desk all the while, but if we're going for this to the greatest degree possible, someone made an incredible point. How much of how that miniature looks is down to the background? A lot, right? The lighting and the quality of the painting, obviously, and it is the focal point, but the background makes a huge difference there. So what if I take my miniature and instead of putting it against a plain background, a white background, a black background, what if I were to prepare something so that I can put him against that. Now oh, I wanted to use actually this, but I can't, it just won't work out. I think, however, I can get a roughly out of focus approximation of at least the colors. So um, this is gonna be something very different. I'm gonna paint something two dimensional. I just primed up a board. This is what we're starting with. Uh, this is gonna be completely different. I don't know if I'll stipple it or if I'll sponge it or whatever, but um, let's make ourselves a chaos -y, fiery background. Okay, so that's it. Were we successful? You can let us know what you think. I was really, really pleased with this model. I mentioned it in the tutorial. I really struggle with my attention span on projects, especially if I get what feels like the large amount of it done soon. I end up like kind of hobbling over the finish line, doing the details and stuff like that. But I just about made it with this one and it was worth pushing through. Still haven't done a base for him because I kind of was imagining him shot up against that background. but. I would like to put him on a base to see how he looks because it seems a shame to have, you know, completed like 90% of a model. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the long, full and in-depth tutorial. Let us know what you would like to see next. If this has thrown up any questions at all about the techniques we use or anything like that, please let us know. We are super close to 100k subs. Please, if you're not subscribed, consider hitting that subscribe button and the bell notification. You can unsubscribe in the future if we start, I don't know, releasing awful tutorials that aren't helpful. But uh, <laughs> if we do that, let us know down below and we'll try and fix them. Final, final note, there is building work going on in the apartment that I live in. So you're going to see some funky voiceovers and some changes coming up to uh, kind of current and ongoing videos for a couple of months, I would imagine. Uh, this one has been recorded in between breaks, between drills going into the wall of my flat. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. We'll catch you in the next video.